In this video, we're going to discuss CT protocols, what goes into a protocol, and we'll walk through a CT head protocol to provide some context. Let's start with a look at what happens when a CT scan is requested. Firstly, as with many imaging tests or exams, a physician will submit a requisition with a request for a CT scan of a certain area, for example, a CT head. And before going ahead and completing the scan, the requisition is protocoled and triaged by a radiologist. In this example, the word CT head will generally mean a CT scan of the brain, but based on the indication and the clinical information provided, the radiologist may code this as a CT brain without contrast or a CT brain with contrast, or maybe a CT angiogram of the brain or a CT venogram or a CT scan of the temporal bones or the orbits or something more specific. So each different scan protocol can have different technical parameters, different injection rates and volumes, different requirements for field of view and z-axis coverage, different patient positioning, different prep protocols and requirements, uh, different reconstructions that will be built and so on. And all of these things tie into an imaging protocol. So it's not just as simple as a set of technical parameters. There's a lot more to it. We're going to look at this sample CT head protocol. And the first thing you may notice is that we have a selection of different CT brain protocols for different age groups. Most of the protocols in a pediatric setting will vary by weight category, but the head is the one exception here, which we happen to do by age, just because that's a better indication of head size. Starting at the top, we have patient preparation. And in this area, some protocols could include oral contrast that the patient has to drink ahead of time, or the patient may be advised to drink a certain amount of water before a scan, or they may be advised to be NPO for four hours prior, they may be asked to abstain from caffeine if it's a cardiac scan and so on. So any of these instructions uh, required ahead of time would factor into the protocol here as patient prep. In this case, it's a straightforward one. There's no prep required for a CT head. Next, we have the scan instructions. So this includes patient positioning. Here we have patient positioned supine, head first, skull base parallel to the axial plane of the scanner. For a CT head, we always try to get the patient to tuck their chin down a bit and position in this manner so that the dense bone from the skull base and the petrous ridges is all in one plane and doesn't impair our ability to visualize the inferior structures of the brain and also it mitigates radiation dose to the eyes. Next, we have the Z-axis coverage, which says scan skull base to vertex. So we're scanning the whole brain. That's pretty self-explanatory. Then we have the injection parameters, and here we have a few different protocols. So if the requisition is graded as C minus, that means it's a non-contrast study, also known as an unenhanced study. Uh, next, we have our C plus or enhanced head, and we have a weight based contrast volume of 1.5 milliliters per kilogram of body weight up to a maximum of 50 milliliters injected by hand or pump one minute prior to scanning. And again, in some sites, this will vary. It's more common to scan a C plus brain at between two to five minutes after the injection for adults. Also note that with adults, you're really always going to use the power injector pump for all injections to ensure consistency, maybe at two or three milliliters per second. And the reason we have by hand or pump here is because sometimes with pediatrics, we're dealing with very small volumes and small IVs. So for a baby head, when you're using a tiny 24 gauge IV in the foot and only delivering 10 mils total, uh, it doesn't make much sense to use a power injector when you can just inject by hand very easily and then wait one minute to scan. We also have this brain venogram protocol, which is essentially just a larger maximum volume injected at a higher rate and scanned with a shorter delay. So that's a good example of different things we can do with the injection to get different images. Moving on to the technical factors, we have our exposure parameters for the scalp images here, and then we have our actual scan parameters, and we'll look down to the adult scan here. For this protocol, we're acquiring data in a helical scan. So we have our tube voltage here, which is 120 kV and our tube current, which is 220 MA. And we have our rotation time, which is 0.75 seconds per rotation. And on the right, we have our pitch, which is 0.625. And on our scanner, that's described as the detail pitch setting. So overall for a CT brain, the radiation dose is relatively high compared to many other scans. Uh, for the brain, we really need to keep the noise to a minimum because we want to be able to differentiate between the gray matter and the white matter in the brain, which are very close in density. So we need minimal noise to maximize our contrast resolution and get good gray-white differentiation. 
To make this even harder, the brain is, of course, wrapped in a layer of bone from all sides, so we need enough radiation to penetrate that skull and give us a good image. So the first component of this is to use a relatively high KV, 120 KV being the standard for many exams. Uh, we have a 0.75 second rotation, which may sound fast, but for many other scans, you're going to be using our fastest rotation speed of 0.5 seconds. So 0.75 is actually relatively slow, uh, meaning that our current time product, or MAS, is going to be relatively high. We're using a low pitch, so the patient is moving slowly through the scanner, and we're oversampling, which is effectively overlapping our data acquisition as the patient moves through the scanner. And the aim of all of these things is to get sufficient radiation to the detector to give us a good signal to noise ratio and a high quality image. Now, I'm describing all of these things as kind of higher dose techniques, but we do have a lower dose head protocol, which is more specifically used just to assess the skull rather than the brain. So in those images, we can settle for more noise. And just to clarify, every discussion on dose is going to be relative. So relative to a CT brain on a 15 year old scanner, our dose here is relatively quite low, but relative to a CT of the facial bones on the same scanner, our dose here is relatively high because we don't have the same demands for lower noise when we're just assessing the bony structures rather than the brain. Here we have the detector configuration and this is telling us that we're going to acquire 40 slices per rotation and generally we're always acquiring at the smallest slice thickness possible, in this case 0.5 millimeters. The exception to this is if you're using a scanner with an adaptive detector array, but with our scanner we're always acquiring at 0.5 millimeters slice thickness. Now moving down to the reconstructions, we're not sending those 0.5 millimeter slices to PAX, we're going to send three planes, axial, coronal, and sagittal, with three millimeter slices at three millimeter intervals, so three by three. They're going to be rendered using volume averaging, so each three millimeter cubic voxel will represent the average measured density in that area. And we'll process this with two different filters. Here we have it described as an algorithm, or you may hear it described as a kernel. And we have a brain filter, which is going to be relatively smooth to try and get rid of that noise and improve our contrast resolution to see that gray and white matter. And we have a sharp bone filter, which is going to do the opposite. So it's going to be sharp to improve our spatial resolution, highlight any tiny fractures or inconsistencies in the bone, and show us all those tiny ossicles in the inner ear and, and so on. So to generate this, we've put our raw data through two different processing algorithms and then built that image data into axial, coronal, and sagittal planes. And that image data is what we're going to send to PAX. We also have some additional comments here. So this stuff could include certain reconstructions required for certain indications. For example, if there's any trauma to the head, we always build a 3D bone rendering of the skull. So that's a broad look at a CT head protocol and what goes into a protocol. When you're developing CT protocols, it's generally a collaborative effort between the CT techs, uh, maybe a QC tech, an application specialist who is an employee of the vendor, so Siemens, Philips, Canon, GE, and so on. And they'll be an expert in that particular machine. And of course, the radiologists. With regard to dose, we are always optimizing to abide by the ALARA principle, meaning as low as reasonably achievable. And ultimately the radiologists are going to have the final say on the level of noise that is considered reasonable without affecting the diagnostic ability of the scan. The numbers and details of the protocol discussed in this video are just to be used as an example. In reality, these protocols are always going to be optimized on a per institution and per scanner basis. As always, thanks for watching. This concludes this series of videos. So uh, I've enjoyed the project. I've learned a lot along the way and I hope you have too. Take care and good luck.